Good morning and welcome to worship at Heritage Fellowship. We're glad that you could join us today for this time of worship, of coming together as the people of God, together even though we're apart in our own homes today. I'm glad you could join us. We do have uh, this beautiful altar uh, that Erlene Shadburn has prepared that reminds us of the season, that reminds us of God's bounty that reminds us that this is the season of thanksgiving. And so let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship, looking to God with gratitude and seeking God's grace and God's goodness in our lives. Come and let us worship the Lord together. Let us pray. Oh God, we have been too long and too much with our eyes on the wrong things, even though we believe them to be right. Lift our eyes to a bigger, better dimension, to be participants in your broadening good presence. We know the pains and the prejudices of life. Help us to experience the best kindness and the gentlest healing that flow from the very heart of the universe. I name you to be God. I believe you to be God, source of all that is good. Let us be a part of good in this world. And now we pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now a reading from Psalm 123. To you I lift my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. 
have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is your help and salvation. Come all who hear, brothers and sisters, draw near. Join me in glad adoration. As we come to our pastoral prayer today, we would draw your attention to our prayer concerns list uh, that you received with the email, uh, with the connection for this service. There are some in our community who have had surgeries in the past week. There are others for whom we want to pray, uh, especially today. And I invite you to hold their names in your hearts as we pray together. Would you bow with me now? Lord, in this season of thanksgiving, we do lift our hearts up with gratitude to you for all that you have done for us. We're grateful for your good gifts, for the gift of life itself, which we so often take for granted. We pray that you would help us to celebrate the life that you've given to us, to celebrate the gifts that you've given to us and to exercise those gifts as we seek to love those whom you send our way. We're grateful today for the gift of church, of church family, of the privilege that is ours to be a community of faith together. We ask that your spirit would empower us for service in the world. We pray for wisdom as we seek to be the people that you would have us to be. Lord, we live in challenging times. We live in a moment in which there is challenge, there is illness, there is anxiety. We ask, O oh God, that you would calm our fears in these days, that you would encourage us and sustain us. We pray for those today who suffer from loneliness and even depression. We pray, O oh God, that you would lift their spirits, that you would help them to find connection and purpose in the world. We do today especially lift up to you the names on our prayer list here in this congregation. We ask that you would be with those who have had surgery in the past week, we ask that you would be present with each one whose name is on that list today, whatever their need, whatever concern and challenge they are facing. We also know that there are many whose names are not on that list. Perhaps those who are watching today may have their own burdens and concerns. And we ask, O oh God, that you would be present with them and care for them in the midst of those challenges. We also know of people whom we care about very much who need your presence in their lives and we ask that as we reflect upon their names in our hearts and in our minds that our reflections would go up to you as our prayers on their behalf. Oh God, as we enter into worship today, we pray for our world we pray for our nation. We pray for this community. We ask that you would show us light in the midst of darkness, calm in the midst of the storm, peace in the midst of the restlessness and anxiety that we feel. May this time of worship and celebration today bring honor and joy 
to you and love and grace to us. For this is our prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. The sermon text today comes from the book of Judges, chapter 4, and verses 1 through 7. We continue our journey together with Israel. We've journeyed with Israel across the wilderness. We've entered with Israel into the promised land. And now, with Israel, we find God's grace in the midst of the journey. Hear now the word of God. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Haroshet HaGolim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidot, 
was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon, with his chariots and his troops. And I will give him into your hand. This is the word of God to you and to me on this Sunday morning. May we take these words into our hearts and covenant together to live our lives out of what they say. I don't know about you, but I'm having a hard time getting into the holiday season this year. For most of us, the season generally starts with Halloween and ends with Christmas, This year, Halloween was a challenging holiday to celebrate. Children still went door to door in our neighborhood, something that actually surprised us very much, though we didn't participate. I didn't put on my really scary Halloween mask, and Gaeth and I didn't sit in the driveway and wait on the kids to drop by for candy like we normally do. Instead, we spent the evening out and we left the house dark. I had the feeling when we went back home that the evening was as dark as it could possibly be. I'm hoping things change and that our spirits lift, or at least that mine do, as we move toward Thanksgiving and then into Christmas. If there has ever been a season in which we needed goodness and light, then it is this season. We need to be reminded that God breaks into our darkest moments and brings hope and healing. And as this season of celebration and thanksgiving and hope and peace and joy and love breaks over us, how do we find God's grace in the midst of troubling times? There's a little phrase that we often use when we thank God for the food that is on our tables. Someone will say, who wants to say grace? Now that's an interesting phrase when you think about it. I wonder where it comes from and what it means, this business of saying grace. It refers, of course, to a blessing over a meal And saying grace over a meal stretches back a long time. The book of Deuteronomy reports that God said to Israel, You shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God. King David thanked God for food in Psalm 136. He thanked, quote, the God of heaven who gives food to all flesh. And Jesus did it providing a model for all of us when at the Last Supper he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. Food is essential to life, and yet food is not something that we make, really, or that we earn by ourselves. All of the essential elements of it come to us as grace, given to us in some ways without our having really earned it. I suppose I should leave the farmers out of this equation who do work hard for it, but most of us simply receive it. And so there's good reason to be grateful for it. But in these days that we now inhabit, these days of pandemic and forest fires and hurricanes and contested elections and anxiety and frustration and loneliness. Well, in these days, sometimes it seems like we have more than we can say grace over. 
That's another interesting phrase, isn't it? More than we can say grace over. When we use it, we don't mean that we have received more than we needed. Rather, what we mean is that so much is going on that we're having trouble finding the grace in it. Grace isn't obvious to us. We feel isolated. We feel alone. We feel separated from others. More is going on than we feel capable of handling. Grace is hard to find. Sometimes life stuns us with loss when we least expect it. We're feeling safe and secure. Life is good. Things are calm and under control. And then suddenly the world shifts on its axis. Everything tilts. We're jarred and shaken. Life is shattered. We're thrown into darkness and sometimes into despair. It might come in a phone call or a TV bulletin across the bottom of a screen or in a conversation with a friend. In such a moment, I think it is right to say that we are experiencing more than we can say grace over. Or to put it another way, we are experiencing so much in our lives that it is tough and challenging and hard and we're having trouble finding any grace in it at all, any goodness, any hope, any possibility. It's easy, isn't it, to celebrate grace when life is good. It's easy to be grateful when all is well and there's a roof over our heads and we can celebrate with friends without wearing masks. And we, when we have an experience, so much death all around us and so much loss. But can God's grace hold us together when everything around us seems to be falling apart? This is the question that is so difficult to answer. We sing about grace all the time, but how do we find it and how do we experience it in the tough times? I have the feeling that Israel was experiencing such a moment way back in the time of the judges. I think grace was hard to come by for them after the death of Joshua and after Israel pushed into the promised land. They had what they wanted, but they were without direction. What had been an initial series of victories over the Canaanites led to a time of intermarriage and covenant with Canaanite tribes and all of that eventually gave way to a series of stunning defeats. God had told Israel not to enter into any covenants with the Canaanite tribes but Israel largely ignored God. Essentially they turned their backs on God Judges 3, the one before the one I read, reports that the Israelites, quote, lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and they worshipped their gods. And God then punished Israel for it, withdrawing God's favor. Grace was hard to come by. I suppose here I should point out that our inability to see God's grace around us is usually not the result of something that we might have done wrong. Sometimes it is just the reality of life with all of the curves and challenges that life throws at us. In the passage we read today, Israel has been oppressed by King Jabin of Canaan for some 20 years. And Deborah is the prophetess of God who is judging over Israel. Through Deborah, God promises that Israel will be victorious over King Jabin in battle. It's a powerful story. Through Deborah, the assurance of God's grace comes. Israel finds hope and light in the midst of its darkness. Despite all that Israel has done to this point in the book of Judges to sin against God, God's grace still comes to Israel. God's grace, you see, is limitless. It is not held back even by the sin of Israel. 
And if Israel can find God's grace in the midst of the darkness that it was facing, a darkness of its own making, then how much more should we be able to find God's grace in the midst of our own darkness and challenge? A darkness that is not necessarily the result of our own making. Isn't this the powerful lesson of the story? It isn't that God's grace comes to me despite my own sin and failure, but it is also that God's grace comes to me especially when I'm facing a challenge that is not of my own making and that I did not anticipate, cause, or expect. Scripture tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, but it doesn't tell us that we have to be filled with joy when we do it. I think God fully expects that sometimes we will give thanks through gritted teeth and without smiling. Sometimes we give thanks to God through tears and anguish and pain. The Talmud in the Jewish tradition teaches that, quote, even when the gates of heaven are closed to prayers, they are open to tears, unquote. Listen to the wisdom of that lesson. Even when the gates of heaven are closed to prayers, they are open to tears. The psalmist says in chapter 56, You have kept count of my tossings or my sorrows and put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your record? I think of this psalm sometimes when I'm turning and tossing in bed with worry. Those tossings and those tears go into God's record. God knows about each one. You may not know that the book of Lamentations, an entire book of the Old Testament, is devoted to crying and tears and anguish to lament. One of my students shared a quote this week from the Buddhist tradition. It simply says, Find the direction your peace is coming from and head that way. Find the direction your peace is coming from and head that way. What a great word of wisdom. We might put it this way in our Christian tradition. Find the direction your grace is coming from and head that way. It might be very dark right now for you. It's often dark and difficult for me. But keep one very powerful thing in mind. God's grace is looking for us. God's grace is seeking us out. You can find grace and goodness and hope even when you and heaven seem barely to be on speaking terms with each other. That is the way God works. I like to say that God has the can't help it. I think this is clear in the passage I read in Judges chapter 4. God can't give up on Israel no matter how badly Israel behaves. And the powerful lesson in this is that if God can't give up on a badly behaving Israel when it has completely and totally turned its back on God, then how much more can God not give up on us when we are honestly and hopefully searching for God and hope and grace and goodness in the midst of all of the challenges of life that come our way? God is, you see, the great it in hide-and-go-seek. God comes calling us in the midst of the darkness, offering grace. That grace may not be clearly evident to us at first. It's the kind of grace that comes through the cracks and the tears and the hurt and the pain. It is limitless grace, yes, But that doesn't mean that it is clearly evident to us at all times. That's why I think 
that the Bible calls us to give thanks in all circumstances. I think what it means is that we should always be looking for the grace always seeking it out, always trying to find the light that God is bringing into our darkness. It is the gesture of gratitude that matters, and not that we have the full measure of gratitude in our hearts or the fullness of grace in sight. That gesture of gratitude is the first indication of faith and hope We're clinging on to God's promise of grace even when we cannot sense it ourselves and even when we cannot see even the slightest trace of it. Our conviction is that God wants to bring hope and love and grace to us no matter what we might face in life. Our calling is to move toward that light and grace even when it is nothing more than a sliver way out there in the distance. What we have to do in such moments is to put one foot in front of the other and move toward it. I don't know what you're facing today, and you don't know what I'm facing. These are not normal times. We often have more facing us than we can say grace over We're living in the midst of such darkness that we have trouble even seeing or sensing the presence of God's grace in our midst. Nevertheless, the promise of God that we all still cling to is the the assurance of God's grace in the midst of the darkness. It is there. We can count on it. It is because of that grace that we may be down, but we are not out. There is a dim light in the distance that beckons us toward that grace. So we must pick ourselves up and move toward it even when it's the very last thing that we think we are capable of doing. We're about to enter the season of Advent in which we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. This is the promise that in Christ God has entered into our darkness and dwells in it with us. So who wants to say grace this year? I hope you will join me in seeking this great thing that God offers to us. It's what we do when we have more than we can say grace over. Through Christ. Amen. And now receive this benediction. God's amazing grace is somewhere out there for you in this darkness that you now inhabit. Reach with strength toward that sliver of light till that moment when the grace fully envelops you and pulls you toward it. For it is this that is the full evidence of God's love and care for all of us. Amen and amen.